He's, he's currently Adelaide Wildlife Consultants, but he's, he's also uh, has really launched a, a new area of economic activity, which is humane wildlife deterrence, rather than killing and trapping. Um, so uh, I think that'll probably do his introduction. Um, so the title of the talk, Pest Control, The Times They Are a Change. Is that uh, sound okay for everybody? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, have sometimes seen a TV kitchen sink drama where a man, in Haggard, walks into a hall and there's half a dozen people sat in a circle on chairs in the middle of the hall and he walks in and the host says, can we help you? And he says, my name's Derek, I'm an alcoholic. Well, my version of that is, my name is John, and I'm a pest controller. Um, after 28 years professional involvement in animal welfare and wildlife protection, with the League Against Cross Sports, as you've heard, Animal Aid itself, I was chairman of Animal Aid at one time, um, nine years on the RSPCA Council, um, I've now been a pest controller for 18 years. This came about in 1988, um, when, no, sorry, 1998, when I left the league after 12 years, um, and my old friend Trevor Williamson at the Fox Project is here today. <coughs> he invited me to take over the Fox Project's deterrence work because their rescue, rehabilitation activities, picking up foxes from road accidents and things like that were getting, expanding rapidly um, and taking up a lot of time. And it's very difficult if you're driving to someone to help deter a fox from a garden, you get a call that there's a fox been run over um, five miles away, you're obviously going to divert. So I took over the uh, wildlife deterrence section of the Fox Project, so it's almost exclusively foxes for at least a while. But then um, I started getting calls on other species, um, squirrels, rats, mice, pigeons, uh, all sorts of animals which were causing people problems, but they didn't want them hurt or harmed in any way. And going to pest controllers, they knew that it would be poison or traps or something equally nasty. The good thing about the first project, of course, is that they had pioneered the idea of stop coming, just deter the animals from whatever problem you were having with them. Um, and eventually, of course, the Fox Project has persuaded virtually every council in, in the UK to abandon expensive um, culling of foxes in favour of deterrence and all you need to do really is know about foxes. There's still plenty of pest controllers killing foxes knowing full well that within days they will be replaced by the neighbouring fox family. There will be competition for that vacant territory once you kill the, the resident territory holders. And the fox project was so successful and the scientific evidence was so um, worthy that even the government now recognises that killing foxes is pointless. And I'll quote from DEFRA's official policy. Previous attempts to kill urban foxes to achieve a sustained population reduction have not been successful in the long term because of the mobility of foxes and their ability to produce offspring in large numbers. Territories made vacant by culling resident foxes are rapidly colonised by new individuals. The most effective strategies to resolve fox problems are primarily relied on non-lethal methods, focusing on preventative and deterrent strategies. So that's a government, a government which is in favour of hunting, in favour of killing badgers, um, but at least the DEFRA section of it uh, is opposed to killing foxes because it doesn't work. The system of deterrence can be applied to virtually 
all wild animals. So you need to know about them. You need to know what territory they like, what they don't like, um, the features that are attracting them. And they're always normally the same. It's the same as we want, food and shelter. Flesh controllers or Achilles foxes, therefore, are still um, can be regarded as combat because um, they never tell the truth. Uh, you go to rent to kill, they will charge you a thousand pounds to kill a family of foxes in your garden. But what they won't tell you is that within a week you'll get a new uh, family of foxes taking over that territory. So they're combat. Um, I started with people with real or imagined fox problems and I've moved on now to other species. As a manager of a 36 acre animal sanctuary in Somerset for seven years, I learned a lot about rats and mice because if you have um, that sort of amount of land and you have pl plenty of horses and cattle and sheep all rescued and pigs and dogs and cats and chickens, you're bound to get rats. So I learned a lot about rats <coughs> from pure observation. Uh, having taken up pest control, um, I took up free subscriptions from the pest control magazines. Um, I became a member of the Mammal Society, a lot of information in the Mammal Society if you fancy becoming involved in this sort of work. I built up a considerable library of, of wildlife literature which I used to devise humane deterrence techniques for all sorts of urban pest problems. I described my book, my, in my book, uh, Living with Urban Wildlife, I told how you could uh, adopt these policies and principles to virtually any pest problem. Recently, or last year, I published my fifth book, which is called The Mouse Stranglers. And I've got copies here if you want them, and Ray sells them as well. Um, and this is a full-on indictment of the pest control industry. Because I've been involved in it, I have their magazines, I have their circulars, I have their literature, because I'm a pest controller, albeit one that doesn't kill anything. Um, the, the pest control industry, in my estimation, and it's only a rough estimate, that they kill between 50 and 100 million British wild animals every year. <coughs> Traps, poisons, snares, guns, everything you can think of. But it also contaminates the entire environment with anticoagulant poison. DEFRA informed me more than a decade ago that 10 million pounds worth of anticoagulant poison is sold in the UK every year. Last year, the Predatory Bird Monitoring Service, which is an independent body, reported that 100% of kestrels, more than 90% of barn owls, red kites, and other birds of prey are contaminated with these poisons, which also has contaminated a high percentage of hedgehogs, foxes, all other predators, and scavengers that eat dead or dying prey species. Because it's obvious that if you've got anticoagulant poison in a rat, um, which is a lively, secretive animal, it's bleeding to death internally, it's going to get slower and slower until it dies maybe two weeks later, and it's obviously the slow ones are going to be picked up by the predators, so the predators get contaminated. Um, with hedgehogs, for instance, they predate, well don't predate, but they scavenge dead rats, full of poison. Hedgehogs are now contaminated. And the European Union has been campaigning against this widespread use of these anticoagulant poisons for years because they endanger non-target species. They are considered carcinogenic and reprotoxic. So they may not kill the non-target wildlife, but they can cause cancer and they also damage the reproductive organs. One of the reasons I believe that hedgehogs are disappearing is nothing to do with badgers, it's to do with poison. 
that the British pest control industry has successfully resisted any reduction in their poisonous arsenals and have only very recently begun to accept measures designed to prevent their poisons hitting non-target wildlife. The fact is the pest control industry is a multi-billion worldwide industry that selects forms of wildlife and labels them as pests. In my view, and I'm sure you will agree with me, there's only one serious pest in this world, and that's the human race. Yes. The only pest whose population is out of control, which pollutes the air, the sea, and the land, to the extent that the planet Earth and every living thing on it is facing catastrophe. Last year, I decided to send my book, The Mouse Stranglers, to the two trade magazines that I receive, one's called Pest Control News, and is produced by Kill German Chemicals, the biggest <coughs> supplier of pest control products in Europe, and the exclusive, exclusive distributors of the rodent strangling machine that inspired the title of my book. I soon learned that they've read it, because I received a letter from their solicitors telling me that Kill German Chemicals intended to not only sue me for libel, but also to apply for a court order to have all copies of my book pulled. Unbelievable. They claim that the description of the machine as inhumane was libelous, and that is why they wanted the book pulled. I responded to the solicitors by saying firstly that the Wild Mammals Protection Act 1996 states that the asphyxiation of a wild mammal is a criminal offence and strangulation is asphyxiation. I secondly told the solicitors that I thought pulping books had ended with the Nazis, but if they wanted to have a go, bring it on. <laughs> I soon received a letter from the solicitors saying their client had decided not to take any further action. <laughs> I also sent my book to the other pest magazine that I get. Uh, it's called Pest Magazine. Um, which is an independent publication which I've criticised for campaigning for the retention of anticoagulant poisonings. They had a campaign saving Save Our SGARs, which is um, uh, anticoagulant poisons. Uh, which, so they gave my book a very nice review, uh, which is not a total surprise because they had previously given a sympathetic review to Animal Aid Alternatives to Culling Booklet and said that every pest controller should have one on its shelf. Indeed, it was Pest Magazine's attitude last year that prompted me to suggest to our handful of non-lethal pest control advocates, such as Foxagon, which you may have heard of, Humane Wildlife Solutions, uh, that's Kevin Newell up in Manchester, my own Humane Urban Wildlife Deterrence, Fox Solutions, that provides um, non-lethal uh, deterrents and products to deter foxes without harming them. Uh, the Fox Project itself, Animal Aid, and the Bird Control Consultancy International. Um, I wrote to them all and said I think it was time that we set up a non-lethal wildlife association. The idea is to try and recruit more people to our little band of humane wildlife managers. If you feel you would like a career in this field, it is possible to earn a living, just as conventional pest controllers do. I calculate that over my 18 years in this job, I've given advice to 35,000 companies, sports clubs, gardeners, councils and householders, and I've accumulated 3,000 paying clients, despite the fact that over the last three years, I've been running down my work, because I don't want to spend five hours a day in a car anymore. Um, in favour of giving advice and forwarding jobs on to uh, people like Foxagon or Humane Wildlife Solutions. If you are interested in a career in pest control, but we could call it wildlife management, um, then you know there are, or you may know somebody that you think would be ideal for this. Then I've made up some followers um, of our No Kill Wildlife Association. And this principles, recommended reading list, uh, plus animal aids advice sheets on deterrence. Grey squirrels, rats, mice and birds. If we get sufficient interest in our venture, we may be able to 
raise some funds so that we can devise courses on humane resolutions of pest problems and candidates can emerge from a course with a certificate to prove their worth to potential clients. I believe the time is right. As a sign of the change creeping into the world of pest control, under pressure from Europe on poisoning, in October I received an invitation from the National Pest Technicians Association, which I previously unkindly called Rat Catchers Union. Uh, and they asked me to give a talk at their prestigious Pest Tech uh, exhibition, it's an annual exhibition in near Birmingham. Um, indeed, they uh, invited me to take a stand with me. I don't have a stand. So I said, well, I'll do the talk, but I won't have a stand. Um, but I welcomed the chance, uh, and I was surprised to get this invitation because they had read the favourable review in Pest Magazine about my book and, and the contents. Now, I know I already knew from Pest Controllers online communications that they regard me as a total nutter, um, but I couldn't resist the chance to talk about the non-lethal strategies for dealing with pest problems. Friends jokingly advised me that if I went, I should text home every half hour in case I disappeared. <laughs> so on the 4th of November, I, wrote, uh, I drove to Birmingham to the National Motorcycle Museum, which held the event. Um, huge event. I mean, all the pest control companies are there, smart business suits, selling the new innovation, the new poison, the new trap, the new snare. Um, and, uh, and full of pest controllers. Um, anyway, I, I didn't, my talk was going to be the last of the day, so I didn't get there till after lunch. And as I arrived at lunchtime ish, uh, I pulled into a crowded car park. Uh, my car was surrounded by pest control vans, uh, all sorts of uh, vehicles. And I saw one single parking place left, so I dived into it. Uh, at the edge of the car park, facing a small field where I parked, just in time to see a guy collecting his ferrets and his nets and a toy rabbit um, after his demonstration in the field of ferreting for rabbits. Next to this demonstration, there was a line of green clad men queuing to try out new air rifles by shooting at targets set at ground level. I thought to myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> Um, anyway, I entered the museum and went to the registration desk where they gave me a tag to hang around my neck with my name and the words Humane Urban Wildlife Deterrence on it in letters I consider to be unusually high. <laughs> um, but I began to wander around the exhibition and I uh, looked at some of the events and some of the things that they were doing, um, all sorts of innovations, uh, and I crept past Kill Germ Chemicals stand when I was suddenly confronted with a National um, te uh, Technical um, Pest Association official. Stood right in front of me, stared at my tag and said, I'm just about to speak and I thought, here we go. He said, do you mind stepping outside a minute? <laughs> I said, why don't you just come in? <laughs> He said, no, I just need a photo for our newsletter. <laughs> After the photo, I found myself to, the, to my way to the lecture hall and sat down at the back to listen to a talk by a pest controller about bed bugs. He explained that he'd invented a cover uh, equipped with heaters, which you put over the bed and heats the beds at 55 degrees centigrade to kill the bed bugs. He specialises in the top hotel trade in London and claims to make £1,600 a day out of getting bed bugs. That was my turn. I talked for 30 minutes. I opened with remark. In 18 years as a pest controller, I've never had to harm a single creature in order to resolve a problem. There was an audible groan from the <laughs> But I carried on, and at the end of my talk, I was amazed at the amount of applause I received. I put this down to politeness, really, um, and thanked the audience and told them that I had brought with me half a dozen copies of my book, The Mouse Stranglers, 
Uh, and if anyone wants one, well, please don't all rush at once. Um, to my amazement, I was immediately surrounded. I saw all of them in less than two minutes. So finally, to make my day, uh, National Test Technician <coughs> Technical Commission, I don't know why they, well, they just call themselves no, the Pest Control, uh, they pulled me aside and said, ignore the pressure to ban anticoagulant rodenticides and public opinion. I think there's a real niche for you lot. Um, and in fact, since I've been invited um, to go back again and to have a stand next year, um, and I would like that to be a no-kill wildlife association stand right in the middle of all the traps and snares and poisons. So if you want to join the revolution and help both people and wildlife, there is no rocket science involved. There's at least one pest control outfit now using drones um, to check for pigeon roosts on high buildings, which struck me as useful for, sitting, uh, for citing pigeon deterrents such as bird free, a Korean harmless gel that is placed in dishes and stuck on the ledges and the birds don't go anywhere near it, far better than spikes. And bird free is distributed by, by my old friends, Kilger and Chemicals, uh, and a downside better than investment in a machine for strangling rodents. It may be that you have skills to help our venture, for instance, if we go ahead with our No Kill Wildlife Association, we'll need a website, uh, advertisements, and leaflets. So designers would be good, and people who are uh, into the modern media not that I am not. Uh, maybe you have a workshop where you could provide humane equipment such as live traps, one-way gates, other devices that can be used by members of the association. For instance, there's a company called Mouse Mesh which produces steel mesh covers to go over air bricks and air vents to stop mice and rats getting into the house. Um, and uh, they've been given a humane award by uh, Peter, or Peter, is that what you like to call it, uh, and is interested in being a member of the No Kill Wildlife Association. We, like, we could have the first No Kill Pest Control Organization to have a stand at the Pest Tech exhibition and at which we may be able to persuade the pest control industry that, to quote Bob Dylan, the times they are a-changing. But they're not changing very quickly. Yesterday, I got my magazine, Pest Control News, very glossy. Don't be looking, and there's almost something interesting in it. Um, they've got one article on poisoning mice in houses, uh, and another one on squirrels, trapping of squirrels. And the guy writes, I'll just read this to you because I'm sure you'll understand more than members of the public perhaps um, where this guy's going wrong. He says, squirrels vary enormously in their behavior once caged. Some of them sit quietly where others thrash and chatter for all they're worth. <clears throat> At this stage, you really need to have your humane dispatch plan formulated as removing a live squirrel from a cage trap is about as difficult as it gets for a pest controller. My favorite technique is to use a small air pistol to dispatch the squirrel in the trap. Ensure discretion when carrying such weapons and ensure neighbors cannot see your actions. I even make sure my clients are unable to view the proceedings as opinions can change in an instant on such an emotive issue. When shooting squirrels in traps, do not be tempted to chase the squirrel around the trap. You will only stress both you and the target, and better to put the muzzle in a suitable killing area and gently guide the squirrel towards the point of impact. Always ensure there is a soft background to your pellet, and even on a, uh, on a pistol, ricochet can have serious implications. Also ensure you have other pellets immediately to hand, should your first shot not kill the squirrel outright. Any squirrels? Absolutely none. There's three million. In my lifetime there have been four official um, national government schemes to slaughter grey squirrels. Millions have died. I remember in the 50s when um, you got a, small boys were encouraged to kill squirrels, cut their tails off, take them to a police station where they would be given a shilling. Um, later it was increased to two shillings. A million squirrels at least died. It costs the taxpayers a fortune, 
and there, and there were more squirrels at the end of it than when we started. So it's just totally pointless. But you know, there's all the propaganda that they're going about damaging trees. You know, red squirrels were persecuted for years and years and years, um, right up until the 1930s. Um, in Scotland, which was a stronghold at the time, and all over Britain. They were persecuted. Why? Because they do what red squirrels do. They strip bark from trees and they will take bird's eggs. So what's the point of killing red squirrels and getting red squirrels back? Uh, they are going to do the same as the grey squirrels did. It's just a joke. Um, and I deal with grey squirrels um, when they're in houses. You know, they get in lofts and they can, they can cause a lot of damage in the loft. Um, and what a pest controller does, he comes along and he puts a bowl of poison in the loft and goes away again. He's been there 10 minutes, he's gone. Charged a fortune um, and uh, it's up to the household then because uh, they usually ask, well, how do I know if they're dead? They say, well, you won't hear them anymore. Um, and they die in the loft, um, they decompose, you get a stain in the ceiling. And all you needed to do was to find out where the squirrel was getting in wait for it to go out and then close the hole. Job finished. And that's what I've been doing now for 18 years. So that's the end of the talk. If you've got any questions, we've got time, I think. Yeah. Um,